If you're like most people, then this is the way you make a shiny reflective material in Blender. But unfortunately, this method is physically inaccurate. The way that your material looks is a big part of how believable the final render will appear, which is why physically based rendering is so important. So that's what we're gonna be discussing in this video, PBR shaders, what is it, what it's all about, and why you should even care. We're gonna be making better materials through physically based rendering. So if you haven't watched the first video yet, uh, go ahead and click on your screen right now and that'll take you to it. It talks all about why photorealism is so important. But photorealism, is one of the big reasons why we most people are interested in physically based rendering because it's all about making things which are accurate to the real world, things that your eye sees every single day. So it's about making the computer adhere to the laws of the, the, the laws of physics in the real world. But even if you're not interested in photorealism, like say you're watching this and you're going like, well, that's good because I'm actually interested in cartoons and uh, I'm not really interested in photorealism at all. Well, actually it still applies to stylized cartoony stuff. Like for example, for Wreck-It Ralph, Walt Disney actually, Walt, I don't know why I call him Walt Disney, Disney um, actually went about creating a PBR workflow uh, specifically designed for artists so that they could create this hyper-real hyper stylized world that's you know set inside a video game, but also make it feel believable, make the materials reflect and behave the way that they do in the real world. And as a result, the, the scene just has, sorry, the movie has this, this nice quality about it where it just things slightly feel a little bit more realistic um, than they have in previous movies, for example. So that, in a nutshell, is what physically based shaders are all about. Materials that adhere to the laws of the physical world. Now, if you're watching this and you're sort of scratching your head and you're like, well, I, okay, but doesn't Cycles already do this? Yes, and also no. Um, cycles does most of it. It does most of it pretty well. Um, however, there are a few things that it does not. Uh, one of the things that it does already, for example, um, is energy conservation. Nothing to do with saving the planet. Um, energy conservation is all about uh, the law that a material can't be brighter than the light that is hitting it. So just as an example, um, I'm just going to open up Blender really quick. I'm just going to do a quick demonstration um, comparing cycles to the Blender internal rendering engine in the regard to energy conservation. So this is cycles with a very basic material using the incorrect method, but just for this example, you can see a diffuse gloss being controlled by a mix shader. So energy conservation is that um, you it can't be brighter than the light that is receiving it. So that means that if you want to see the diffuse, you have to be seeing less of the reflection. So using this mix shader, you can see that as I turn down the mix shader, the gloss is becoming less. So that is correct. And you can see if I want more gloss, you're actually seeing less of the diffuse. You're seeing less of that red color. So that that's how this works. Now you can cheat, you know, you could add an add shader, but the mix shader, it just makes it easy. It forces you into this realistic workflow. That's just how it works. And also the, um, the roughness of the reflection is really important as well. You can see that the sharper the reflection, you can see the brighter that that reflection becomes. Whereas the the you know, the more you make it, uh, the more smoother, what do you call it? The softer the reflection becomes, the more dimmer it appears because it's stretching that reflection out over a larger surface. So there you can see really bright and then really soft as it as it goes up. Now contrast that with the Blender internal rendering engine, okay? Something which most of you probably have not used for a long time, myself included. In fact, I think this is the first time I've used it in maybe a couple of years, just for this little example here. Um, if you forgot how Blender internal uh, works, essentially this is the exact same material here. We've got a diffuse and we've got a specular, but you can see that these aren't related to each other. So I can just increase this specularity here and this becomes brighter, but it doesn't reflect, sorry, it doesn't change the amount of the diffuse that you're actually seeing there. And you can see I can turn it down, it doesn't change at all. Um, as well as that, I can turn up the hardness of the specularity there, and it's not getting brighter. That's the same amount of um, reflective light, and I can make it wider there. And it should be getting dimmer, but it's not. It's the exact 
uh, same amount. So you can see the difference between the two. Cycles is physically accurate, whereas the Blender internal is not. And that's why, well, that's one of the very, very many, many reasons why Cycles looks a lot nicer than it does um, in the Blender internal engine. And this, by the way, the Blender internal engine here functions in a lot of ways to the way old game engines used to work. So if you've ever, let me go back to the demonstration here. If you, if, you, if you woke up one morning and you were like, okay, PBR, why is everybody talking about PBR? It's because so many people are in the game industry and they have been forced into uh, the internal, this, this way of setting up sliders and things and having to tweak it like every time the character moves into a different environment or you know different props in different areas, they had to tweak materials in order to get them to work. But now a lot of game engines are moving to the cycles way of doing things. So they're physically accurate. So now they don't have to do that. So that is why so many artists today are now talking suddenly about PBR rendering. So that's it. So cycles does some of it like co energy conservation, but there are some things that it does not. So uh, it does energy conservation, check. It does linear space, which is another thing we won't talk about, but it's pretty boring. Basically keeping everything in the same color space, check. Um, Fresnel, it does not automatically do it. Proper roughness, it does not automatically do it. And when I say automatically, I mean in the same way that the mix shader sort of automatically forces you into that workflow. You don't have to use a Fresnel. The, the Fresnel you can make, and we will in just a moment, we will make some really nice looking Fresnel. You can do it in cycles, but it's not there by default. And that's what this video is really all about. So I'm gonna, we're gonna start by, I'm gonna show you how to set up an accurate looking uh, Fresnel effect and then an accurate roughness. So we'll talk about what sort of roughness we're actually talking about there. Um, and then finally, we're gonna combine all of this into one easy shader. And this is the most important part because um, when you're watching this, you're thinking like, oh my goodness, all this stuff I have to do. Every time I wanna make a simple shader, I wanna make a glossy thing, I have to go through all this pain. No, actually in the future, once you have finished this video, you will have this guy right here this super easy one shade. It's gonna be easier than just using a diffuser and a mix shade or whatever in the future, because you're just gonna be adding this one node, and I'm gonna show you how you can actually save that into your Blender file so you can have it always ready. Um, so that in the future you wanna make something reflective, you just add this guy in, and you got some quick, easy sliders that you can um, use to make stuff look awesome. So, all right, without further ado, uh, oh, actually, first of all, before we continue to the Fresnel stuff, I wanna give a shout out and credit to most of the stuff I'm about to teach you comes from Cinecap Pro. He was the one who really introduced me to all this. Um, so I watched a whole bunch of different videos, um, read articles by like Marmoset and uh, Algorithmic, Google Docs that people have been putting together. And no one really explained it as clearly as Cinecap Pro did. So, and he even helped me out on Twitter with a bunch of questions that I had. So a big shout out to him. Um, you can click, his, click this here if you wanna check out his video uh, playlist as well. Very good at explaining things. Highly recommend it. Um, all right, Fresnel. Let's talk about Fresnel. What exactly is Fresnel, or Fresnel, as I was told that it is? But I'm, I'm not. I think it's Fresnel. I used to call it Fresnel in my old videos, and then someone told me it's Fresnel. And then last week in the other video, someone said it's Fresnel. I don't know what to believe. All right. <laughs> so Fresnel is this that. As the surface that you're looking at tilts more and more at an angle, you see more ref reflectivity. So this is the ball that you can see right here. And you can see it, this, that's what this is representing right here. In the middle here, there's no reflection. You're just seeing the diffuse material. And then as it goes out and out and out further and further and further, you're starting to, uh, it's starting to become more and more reflective. That is a real material. That is how real materials work in the real world. And you will know this if you have ever um, actually, first of all, just to quickly explain it, this is um, how Fresnel basically works. It, it's like like a skipping stone, okay? So you can imagine if you were standing over a lake and you threw a stone at the at the lake directly at your feet, it's gonna cut through the, the water and you're gonna, yeah. Whereas if you throw it really far out and hard enough, I guess, it's going to ricochet and bounce off it. So that is basically Fresnel in its effect. Um, at an angle, it's, it's grazing off that and you're seeing a reflectance of what is over here. Whereas more directly, you're seeing less of the reflections and you're actually seeing the material underneath it, which in this case here is a nice red paint, uh, or just red diffuse, we'll call it. Um, so that is Fresnel in a nutshell. 
Um, you will know this if you've ever stood uh, at a lake and you've looked out across it. You'll notice that way in the distance there, it's almost a mirror. Um, it's very close to a mirror. Um, and that's because it's so far out that the, the amount of reflection you're getting is almost 100%, almost. Um, it's about, I think I would, this is a rough guess, I wasn't there. I would say 70 degrees, right? Um, but as the angle changes and you're looking more and more and more towards at your feet, you're actually uh, seeing less and less the reflection and you're seeing the material underneath it, which in this case, the material, which is water, is a transparent material, obviously. So you're seeing through that and then you're seeing the, the uh, creek bed underneath it. So that's Fresnel. And that's how most people, like when you think of Fresnel, you think of like a river or sorry, a, a lake um, and just looking across the water. But Fresnel is present in every material, like car paint, for example. Um, it's the exact same thing. So way up in the top there in the distance, it's super reflective because it's almost at a 90 degree grazing angle. Not that, maybe like just at the tip there. Um, but as the angle changes, and this is down the, the hood of the bonnet here, as it changes and goes down and down and down and down, um, you're seeing less of the reflection and more of the material underneath it, which is a red car paint. And this example, I love this one, because you can really see, I think you can almost see the 90 degree angle just on that edge there. It's a pure reflection, basically, just on that edge there. And then because of this clear line, I like that you can see it, um, as it moves more and more and more towards the center there, um, it, you're actually seeing more of the mug material, the, uh, the clear, uh, sorry, the, the, the white ceramic there as that angle changes as it goes across. Um, so that's Fresnel. And remember, this is the most important thing. Everything has Fresnel, everything. Not just lakes, not just coffee cups, not just, what was the other one? Car paint, everything has Fresnel, every material. And think of like the most rough material, non-reflective material you can think of, it's got Fresnel, even a brick. In fact, click here and there's a little example of it um, on a great article where a guy actually used a camera and set it up so he could separate the reflectance values from the diffuse values and took a photo of a bunch of different things like brick um, and a whole bunch of different things and everything has reflectance to it. Everything has Fresnel. Um, in fact, <laughs> V-Ray even has a shirt that you can buy that says everything has Fresnel. So remember, next time you're making something, you have to use Fresnel. And in fact, you should be using the method that I'm about to teach you right now. So this was the standard way that you would make a glossy material. What I'm gonna be doing is showing you a very, well, it's kind of simple. We'll sh I'll just, we'll jump into it. Basically, it's adding a bunch of stuff right into that factor input instead of just leaving it blank. So let's go ahead and do that right now this guy okay all right just so that you guys can see the keys that i'm pressing because i know people like to see that all right and i'll just delete everything and replace it with a sphere and i'll make this smooth with some subsurf just so that we don't see any bumpy reflections in it um all right and now i'll just load up the node editor right here add a new material, and we'll just set up that very basic material that we had for all those examples, which is a mix shader with a glossy shader. And we're gonna be making a cool, cool looking material um, using just this stuff right here. Um, so I'll set this to red, and let's give this a look. You should see this terrible result, and that's because we haven't got anything in our scene to reflect. So just for this example, so that you guys can actually see what we're looking at, um, I'm gonna load in an HDR, which is one that I just have on file. Um, if you want, <laughs> a little plug, you could use Pro Lighting Skies. Um, but in this case, there's no, uh, nothing below the horizon line because it's just skies. Um, so I'm actually just going to be using um, an HDR that I had on file, but you can use any that you find online. Um, there's a whole bunch of free ones out there if you want. Uh, uh, what's it called? It has to be an environment texture if, an H if it's an HDR. So there we go. Now, why is that not working? Oh, there we go. Wait for it. Hey, there we go. So this is just a 360 degree HDR so that we can see some reflections and I'll increase the brightness there. Awesome. Okay, back to the material. So we've got a diffuse, we've got a mix shader. And if I increase or decrease this, um, you can see I turned down the roughness. You can see we haven't got any for now. Looks horrible. So that's what we're gonna do right now. To add Fresnel to this model, really simple. <laughs> All you do is go input Fresnel 
drop that in here, then take the output of that factor input and put it into the factor input of the mix shader. And voila, we have Fresnel. Now, you might be thinking, gosh, Andrew, did you really have to make a you know super long video just to add one node, really? You couldn't have just said that at the start? Well, actually, there's, there's more to it. Because unfortunately, as much as this sounds like this should work correctly, it isn't. I don't know why, I don't know why, I don't know the reason, maybe a developer can fill me in on it. Um, but if you have a look at just this Fresnel effect, which you can do if you enable the Node, ra bleh, node Wrangler add-on, make sure you have that checked. It's default with Blender, you just have to check it. Um, I highly recommend it for everything we're doing here. It allows you to control shift left click on anything in your Node editor and you can just see that result. Super, super helpful. Anyway. So if you have a look at this, you can see that it, it seems correct. It's white on the edges there, and then towards the middle, it's darker, but it's not black, it's gray. I don't know why. That's, someone can fill me in, maybe, um, but it should be black, that should be black, because it, the, these values here, the white value is gonna become the bottom input, which in this case is a gloss, um, and the black value is going to become diffuse. But because it's not, it's not completely black, you're still getting some reflection no matter where you are in this, uh, this angle here, which is crazy. That's not how it should be. So this, there shouldn't be any reflection right about here, but there is. So we're gonna fix that right now using a really handy method that I learned from Cinecat Pro. I don't think I would have learned this without him. So again, big thanks to him. To do this, we're gonna duplicate this Fresnel node, and then I'm going to add in a geometry node, this guy right here. And in this geometry node, I'm gonna take the incoming output and put that into the normal of this second Fresnel node. So if we control shift click on this, this is what we're looking at right now, it's gray. Now, what this is doing, what we're telling Blender right now is take the incoming, so treat this, this Fresnel, because we're plugging it into the normal there, as if we are looking directly dead center on the surface, like directly face onto the surface all the way around it. So that means that the surface right there in the middle there is the exact same shade of gray as this one right here. So we've essentially, we've just isolated that exact color right there, which means that if you do this clever little math at a math node, then put this, into the top input, this one into the bottom input, and select subtract, control shift click, bam. Now you can see that the center there is completely black. So we have told it to subtract this shade of gray from this Fresnel effect, which has given us a completely black value. Super cool, and that's it. So now if you take this and plug this into the factor input of our mix shader, voila. There we go. You can see now that in the center there, there is no reflection, just as there should be, like that. Um, so again, in comparison to what it was before, there's some reflection in the middle there when there shouldn't be, and now there is not. And there you go. You've now got accurate Fresnel. So um, to clean this up a little bit, go ahead and con hit Control H on this geometry node, which is a handy little shortcut. And what that does is it hides, oh, I did it again. I did it in my little uh, trial tutorial too. Don't hit Control G. Uh, control H uh, just hides any input or output which is not being used in a node. So just to you know make it so it's not too crazy and you feel overwhelmed when you look in your node editor. Um, so there you go. Now jumping back over to our slideshow over here, we've now checked off the first one, which is oh gosh. I wish it wasn't this far back. Step one, Fresnel, now complete. Now we're gonna move on to step two, roughness. So what is roughness, you might ask? Let me fill in some time while I find the right slide. Proper roughness. Roughness that affects the Fresnel effect. So that is what roughness is about. Okay, to explain this, Let's look at these two pictures here. On the left, we have a surface which is very smooth. So we've got a lot of reflections there. So it has very little, it has low roughness. And as a result, it has high Fresnel. You can see that the Fresnel effect is really extreme all the way around it. 
on the right hand side in contrast a wooden ball i don't know what it is i'm like i'm really glad i found this photo that i was trying to find like gosh is there a ball that's rough out there and i found this and i'm like yes score um you can see this is high roughness and as a result it has low fresnel so this is a law a physical law basically that that effect of the the rays sort of ricocheting off the surface it changes when you have roughness because this is how roughness works the, the first example here, the billiard ball, is this one. It is a clean, uh, smooth surface, so the rays are just bouncing off it and they're going and they're hitting the camera, just like that. However, on a rough surface, a rough surface is actually like this one down here. At, it doesn't, I know it doesn't look like that at the surface, like it's not bumpy, but if, if you go to a micro surface level, like zoom in with a telescope or whatever, you're seeing this amount of bump across the surface. That is what, that's the difference between a mirror and say, what's something that would match that? Like a desk, like a, a sort of smoothed out looking reflection. It's that across the surface, you've got tiny little bumps across it and that is breaking up these rays. So the rays are sort of bouncing around at different angles and only some of them are actually hitting your eye. That is how roughness works. So in relation to Fresnel on a surface, you, you can see why this would have this effect because the more rough your surface is, the more those rays at that grazing angle there are just bouncing off and ricocheting everywhere to the point that none are actually hitting the camera. So that is why the reflectance is more, uh, is more visible on a smooth surface and on a rough surface, um, it is less visible. So yeah, this is how it should look. So this is what we've got currently, this incorrect value. We've got Fresnel, which is good, nice. Uh, but the rougher it is, if we turn up that, that, that roughness of our, our thing, uh, it doesn't turn down the, the Fresnel. The correct value should be like this. As the roughness increases, the Fresnel should drop off. Now, you might be thinking when you look at this, like, well, that's great, but I actually like the first one. Well, what we're talking about, we're talking about what's correct, not what looks good. We can change this in the future if you want, that's totally fine, but getting it correct is really important, um, again, for being physically accurate. So it's one of those things that you can set it up now and you don't have to think about it again. And it's always gonna look accurate. And then those few times that you wanna exaggerate things, you can go in there and you can exaggerate it because you know which things to tweak. So um, let me check, yeah, okay. Now let's go to our little node here. Oh, which one actually was it? Hmm, this one. Now we're gonna add in the roughness effect. So what we want is we want, um, so yeah, just to demonstrate, turn up this roughness here. It's not fading. I can turn it all the way up and you can see I've still got a Fresnel effect, which I should not. So what we want is we want one value which will control this roughness and also affect our Fresnel over here. So you can do this very simply by adding in a value node. And this value node, if I connect this into the roughness input of our glossy node there, you can see that it's now just effect, it's, it's controlled by this, whatever I set this to right here. So with this, what I'm gonna do, <clears throat> let me get a drink here of my green tea because it's winter here in Australia and my voice gets really croaky when I do tutorials for 10 minutes, that seems. I'm gonna add in a mix RGB node and I'm gonna just move this geometry node out a little bit I'm gonna take the output of this incoming node, put this into the bottom input here, and then I'm gonna move this into the top normal input of our Fresnel. Now, I know you're thinking like, oh, wait a minute, I was with you for this part, but now I'm getting really confused. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say that as this roughness value here increases, we want to treat it more, we wanna treat it more and more as if we are looking at it front on. Essentially, remembering that these two values here, the incoming with the Fresnel there, is making it Fresnel zero. It's this, the, uh, the basically the black color in the middle there. Oh, it was, now we screwed it up. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what that, oh gosh, don't click around, it'll scare you. Um, that, that's what this is doing. So with this, I'm gonna take the output of this value node and put that into the factor input of the mix shader here, sorry, the mix RGB node here. Um, and now, if we look at this, you can see that it looks weird, okay? And if you look at your shader, 
it definitely looks weird. It should not look like this. And this is because, and again, big shout out for Cinecat Pro for discovering this, because there's no way I would have figured it out. For some reason, Blender, well, I'm, probably there is actually a good reason for it, but it doesn't know that this is a surface node. Like, it doesn't know, like it thinks that this is just a color, which it is a color. So we're gonna add in a bump node here, put that into the top input, and now it figures it out. It goes, I get it now, we're talking about a normal, like the uh, a surface normal. So now we've got this value here, which if it is on zero, it's going to be using this top input here, which is this one. And then as you go further and further, it's gradually going to start using the bottom one, which is this one. So I know these, these values here don't mean anything, so don't worry if that confuses you. Um, I'll show you the same thing again on this, uh, this subtract node here. Just having a look at the Fresnel, you can see that now, as I increase this, this white value slowly starts to drop off and to the point where it goes all the way to one and there is no Fresnel. And that is exactly what we want and that's all we need to do. So then, if I put this, uh, make sure that you've got it affecting both the diffuse input, sorry, the diffuse roughness as well as the glossy roughness. Diffuse roughness is like a small thing, but apparently they should both be driven by the same thing. It's like porous, the more porous a material, like think like a ceramic clay dry vase, like that kind of look. Yeah, anyway, that's that's the roughness of diffuse. Um, and then you've got the gloss and now it's being driven by that. So now have a look at this. This is zero roughness. And now we can increase that and you can see that it's starting to get more and more faded. And so there's less and less for now. Ha ha, it is accurate, finally, which is great. But now it's looking kind of, it's looking a little unseemly, right? We've got stuff all over the place and I don't expect any of you to want to have to recreate this whole setup anytime you wanna make a material. So let's clean it up and start making the part three, which was, uh, I'm doing it again. I should have learned my lesson the first time. Step three, combining all of this into one easy shader. So we've done this, we've done this. Now let's make it into one little shader so that it's super easy in the future um, and we can just uh, keep reusing stuff. So um, first things first, let's take this Fresnel effect and add it into its own group. So to make a group, as I've just done, Control G. So you select the nodes you want and hit Control G. Um, now you can see that it's got one input that was being plugged into it. So this is why that is you know, a separate input right there. Um, so this, you can actually name that input. See how it just says fact there? It's not helpful not at all. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this roughness. And now that is our roughness slider. Um, as well as that, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna allow us to, in the future, add a normal input, a bump map. In fact, let's actually do that right now because we we're gonna do this later on anyway, but we're gonna make a material which is not just a shiny plastic ball because let's face it, really easy to make a shiny plastic ball look good um, or possible. <laughs> um, let's make an actual material like a brick, for example, uh, a brick surface. So with this sphere here, I'm gonna UV unwrap it very quickly just by hitting U, proje surface projection, sphere projection, there we go. And then I want these to actually be squares. Good, they are squares, so I just stretched it out. Um, now that I've done that, I can get rid of that. Um, so now I'm gonna start assembling a, yeah, a proper material, brick material. So I'm gonna add in an image texture right here. Go open. Uh, right, and I'm using some materials off Polygon, which you can get yourself from the interwebs. This guy. Um, so go to polygon.com um, and you can just type in brick or whatever. You got a whole bunch of brick. So Polygon, of course, full disclosure is my own website. Um, and we made it because it's got all of the textures that you actually need for stuff, which I'm about to show you. So instead of it just being a standard color map, you've also got displacement, you've got gloss, you've got normals, you've got reflection maps, etc. So we're gonna use all of them right now. So I'm gonna use this one right here, which is brick one. And I will load this guy in. Uh, yep, this color one. I won't use the Alberta because it does look a little strange sometimes. 
So I'll plug that into the color input and this should start to look a little bit more interesting, not just a red sphere anymore. Okay, cool. It looks like bricks that have been trapped under a shiny sphere surface. So now let's add in that normal map, which is what I wanted to do to demonstrate this. So I'm going to duplicate that, hit the X, open up the normal map, which is this guy right here. Bum, bum, bum. And then feed this through a normal map input. Sorry, a normal map node. Drop that in there. Feed that into here as well as here. Now, if you look at this and you go, that looks weird. Uh, it does. <laughs> and that's because whenever you're using any map at all, that is not a color map, which is a map that is contributing to the actual color, physical color of the material. Uh, it needs to be set to non color data. When you do that, it instantly starts to look like a real material actually should. But one thing to note though, is that even though this is going into the diffuse and going into the gloss, it's not affecting our Fresnel. The Fresnel is untouched by this because we are not, we haven't told the Fresnel to use this normal map. Um, and the way we would do that is by plugging it into uh, uh, this bump map input right here. So because we can't do it, we haven't got an input here. This is how you create a new input. Very simple. You just plug that into the group input and it makes one for you. How cool is that? So now I just take this and I prog, prog. <laughs> I plug that into that input right there. And now the Fresnel is actually using this brick there. So that's important because all of those surfaces, that, that stuff about the angle of the surface that I just mentioned, it applies to the bump as well. So you can see that on the edge of that brick there, that's just the same as it should be, as if it's on the edge of the sphere. So that's why it needs to use the bump. It's abs absolutely critical that it uses the bump. Um, yeah, or else the Fresnel won't look correct. So now, look at that. I mean, you probably won't start to notice much of a difference uh, yet, but it is actually, now you've got some Fresnel on the edge of those bricks there. So far, so good. This is getting a little crazy though, isn't it? We've got stuff sort of going everywhere. So I made a node group for our Fresnel here. And in fact, I didn't actually name it. So let's call it Fresnel. Move this here. Now I want to actually make a node group for our main shader. So I'm going to combine this diffuse, this gloss, everything here. So we don't have to worry about this in the future. So to tidy this up, this is what I like to do. If you hold down shift and drag left click, it makes what is called a reroute, like a little node that you can like drop in somewhere and like reroute it. And if you want to delete it, by the way, you just hit control X. Um, that'll delete something whilst also keeping its connection. Two little shortcuts for you. So shift, hold shift and then left click like that. I'll clean up these roughness ones right here. Um, and you can see that it makes this easier to read now. Like it's pretty easy to tell what this roughness is uh, connected to because it's like one single stream instead of a whole bunch of squiggly spaghetti lines going everywhere. Um, and also in terms of making a group shader, which I'm gonna do right now, I hit control G. It's now just three inputs right there. Whereas if it wasn't, if I'm not going to do it right now, but if that wasn't there in one neat rerouted thing, you would get like triple inputs for every single one, which is just frustrating. So that's how I've cleaned that up. Let me move this across here because otherwise you guys are going to be squinting at your screen going, what are you clicking on? Seriously? All right, move that up there. Da, da, da. Okay, cool. So we've now got where we're now midway through our step three, which was creating the final looking node there. Uh, that's the normal map. Let's name some of these inputs because it's crucial, crucially important that you name your inputs or else you'll never be able to understand how to use your node in the future. So that's the normal input. Obviously it's blue is pretty obvious. This one here, the gray one is the roughness, but actually a little note here. <clears throat> See this roughness? This is just a single slider here. Now, as a demonstration, I'll show you, if I just add a mix RGB node here, if I take the factor input there, which is a slider, and put that into a new input, you can see now I get an actual slider. Now, I'm hoping that in the future, it, there's a way that you can actually change it here, so you don't have to do this sort of archaic way of adding a dummy node, just so that you can steal a certain type of slider. Um, but that's how you do it. So if you want a slider like this, you have to make sure that the first time you connect it 
to here, for example, that it is actually from whichever value you want it. So if I want this yellow value here, which I actually do, then I would take it from this, uh, this one here, put that in there. Now I can delete it. Okay, so let me delete that one and the roughness because what I want to do is put that, uh, plug that into there. There we go. And then I will call this one. Sorry if that was confusing. Um, all I did was I just deleted the, uh, I, I just made it so that this is no longer gray and that there's not a slider value there, that this is now a white value. And I'll show you why I did that. Um, Cause I want this to be recognized as an image, like an image goes into this input because we're gonna do something roughness map like that. Um, we're going to do something right now. So as I mentioned in part one, the photorealism video, <laughs> photorealism explained video, um, it's important that for your material, every part of your material has varying amounts to it. So the roughness, the reflection, the color, the displacement, everything needs to be slightly chaotic like it is in the real world. There's in the real world. There's no continuous constant value in any material. It always goes up and up and up and down. So we're going to use a roughness map, which is like what we have on Polygon. You have the displacement, you have the gloss. That's what a roughness map is. It's the gloss map. Different programs call them different things. We call it gloss. Um, it's sometimes called roughness, but it's gloss. Normal map that controls the bumps and then reflection map controls which parts of it are reflective. We'll get into that a little bit. For now, let's just talk about the uh, adding the gloss map. So I'm just duplicating this normal map here. I'll delete that and do, 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 gloss. Open that. Let me get another drink here. I gotta say green tea. <clears throat> oh man, it's like pouring water through a bale of hay and then just drinking the remains. <sighs> I don't get it. I mean, I just drink it because it's good for you and this one happens to be decaffeinated. Yeah, anyway. It is what it is. You want to be healthy, you have to grin and bear it. Uh, so this is the roughness map. Okay, cool. Um, now, it's now, believe it or not, you can't really see much there. Now you can. <laughs> it's affecting which parts of it are, sh are shining. Like this is how the actual map looks right here. So it's just a grayscale thing. Some parts black, some parts white. Um, and it's, it's varying the amount of reflection, which is cool. But you will notice looking at this, hey, that looks cool. I like it, it looks like painted brick. Um, but you will notice that looking at this, as an artist, you're thinking like, great. So I don't actually have control over the brightness of anything. Like where's my reflection slider? Where's the mix shader slider, which I'm so used to. And this is one of the big reasons why a lot of artists don't stick with PBR um, rendering because it's not flexible enough. It's not a flexible enough tool. And that's also why Disney, I, I said at the start with Wreck-It Ralph, they spent so long making a PBR workflow that was suitable for artists. So you ha even though there's things in the real world which are, you know, like a real world, what do you call it? Gosh, what was I talking about? Um, so e even though there's, there's like laws of the real world you have to adhere to, an artist still needs to have flexibility in order to tweak things themselves. So we need a reflection value and we need to be able to control how sharp our reflection looks so that even though we've got something in our roughness map here, we still need to be able to control, like override this map if we want to. And that's what I'm gonna show you right now. So we've got this roughness, which goes in here and controls that. Now what I wanna do um, is I wanna add another slider right underneath it. And to do that, because I need that extra little, the slider that I want, I'm gonna steal it, plug that in there, then I'm gonna delete it. And I'm gonna call this one less slash more. And what this is gonna do is it is going to control whether I want more roughness or less roughness, um, despite what this map says, or as well as what this map says. So to do that, um, first of all, just so that I remember, um, I'm gonna make it, these minimum and maximum values here are what this slider here is, right? So you can see it goes from zero to one. Um, if I set this minimum to minus one and go out of it, you can see that now I can slide that all the way from minus one to one. You can always override it by entering in any value you want, but it's just that the slider itself is, bet is locked between those values there. And then I wanna set the default value to zero. 
And so what this is gonna do is that with a roughness map plugged into here, if it is set to zero, I want it to just use the roughness map as it is. If I increase it, I wanna make it more and more rough. If I decrease this, I wanna make this more and more smooth. So this was the method that I thought as myself as an artist, what sort of controls would I need? This is the control that I came up with that I've been using and it works really, really well. So I'm gonna show you uh, how this works. And this was actually a funny thing. Um, in order to get this set up, I, I spent way too long dealing with math equations and everything. Like how do you make a, something contribute to the black values as well as the white values? I eventually put a call out on Twitter, said can anybody help me with this? And so many people contributed answers, it was crazy. But again, Cinecat Pro, shout out again, was the one who came up with the simplest, best solution. That's what I'll share with you right now. So it's a mix RGB node, and we're taking the output of the roughness node, putting that into the input right there, and then taking the less more input, sorry, out, input output, <laughs> putting that into the factor input, then we're setting this to overlay. Now, if I set this to be dark, oh, actually it's not plugged into anything. I then need to connect this and override the roughness right there. So if I set this to be, that's not being affected at all. Let me try this so that I can actually see it. It's actually not being affected. Hmm. Because of, oh, cause it's actually, okay, it's controlled by this. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, okay, cool, got it, got it. Okay, this this part down here, this is the part that we need to um, set up our little math to. Actually, let me just check that I'm getting this math correct, because otherwise this will be very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. Okay, the math, the amount goes into, oh, it goes into there, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. All right, I feel ya, I, I feel ya, <laughs> I feel ya, man. Um, this goes into here. This is one of those things that you don't need to understand. You're gonna do it once and you're gonna forget about it. And that's the way that it should be. The factor amount is always set to one. This here is set to multiply. Okay, so it's multiply 0.5, add 0.5. I don't know why this works. Then you, uh, so it's taking the value that we set here and it's multiplying it, it's adding it, feeding it into the bottom input and overlaying it as one. And then that's going into the roughness, which means if you increase this, it becomes super, super rough. And if you decrease it, it becomes super, super sharp. And scratch that just for a second. I just realized that moving this slider, it doesn't quite work the way it should. <laughs> so I, re I had to pause it just while I figured it out, but these need to be flipped. My goodness, there's so much to remember this one little thing. <sighs> Okay, so the less more goes through here, here, here. It's in the top input, not the bottom. There, there. Now this works as it should. So you can see that as I go all the way up, it's like treating this this map here, this one, it's making it more and more dark. Um, in fact, this is what we're gonna do so that we don't have to bother with this math again. I'm gonna hit Control G, exit out of that. Um, I should just name these just so that it's correct, but we'll just say uh, map and then we'll say amount, there we go, oh, and we will call this, we will call this the less more node, there we go. So now, now that we've created a group, and this is why I wanted to do this part, um, is because if I set this to less more, put this in here, so when it's set to zero, it's exactly the same as the map that is right there, and then as you increase it to one, it slowly, gradually gets more and more white. And again, white in this regard, in the regards to roughness, means it is more rough. And then as you go back to zero, it's using the map again, go negative and it's becoming more and more dark. And finally it's dark. Yay! Took so much work to figure all that out. Ah, happy to finally have it done so I can teach you guys. I mean, give it to you guys. You guys can use it, yay. Um, or really pass it on, Cinecat Pro figured it out. <laughs> okay, uh, cool. So, now I'll plug all this back into it so that we can actually see it again. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so now we have a slider to allow us to change the sharpness of the reflection when we want. So, um, I can turn that up or down. And by the way, if you don't want this map in here at all, 
You can set this to black. And in fact, that is what this value should be here by default. You can set the default value. So I can set that to black so that when I make a new node, when I drop this into any scene that I want, which is this one, it's automatically set to black. So now, even if you don't have a roughness map to work with, because I know that not everybody does, you can just use this less is more, less, less more, and it works the exact same way. So just leave it at black. And then the more you set this to less or more, um, you're changing the roughness value. So there you go. Pretty simple stuff. Now there's one more thing though, one more thing. And that is we want something to override the Fresnel effect. Fresnel, Fresnel. Uh, because even though Fresnel is working quite well, um, you can't do control shift click on this, by the way, because it's inside a node group. It's very annoying. I wish you could. Um, but so to demonstrate it again, emission. Do, 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 do. So this is the Fresnel effect, which is working as it should, but we want a way to control. So, and, and this is just an artist tool because this isn't physically accurate, but we want a way to give some reflection back here when we want it, because you don't want an artist to get so frustrated that they just close the node down. You don't want you to do it when you're working late at night and you've been stressed out over this scene. You just want a way to control it like you used to. So we're gonna add in a control so that we can give back to this, this part down here. And we're gonna do that through a mix RGB node. So you can imagine that this is the default value right there. The more I increase this to actually, this is supposed to be set to screen. And all we're going to be doing is giving some white value to it. Because remembering that white equals reflection. So if I increase that a little bit like that, if I just plug this in here, you'll see the effect. There. So if I increase this, you can see it gets more and more reflective. It's a, a rough reflection right now. Um, so that's why it doesn't look so shiny. But you can see that it gets more and more reflective to the point that there is no Fresnel effect. We're just now simply controlling the uh, the reflectivity of it. Uh, whereas if I turn it down, it becomes, uh, yeah, more using more of the Fresnel effect. So this is a way that you can have that, that slider that everybody likes, that mix shader slider that everybody uses with the gloss and that and just go, yeah, I want more reflection, less reflection. You can have that as well as the Fresnel effect. So it's in the background. You don't have to think about it. It's all fine and dandy. So that is just what this does. And then as well as this, what I want to do is make it so that I can put an image in here, an image input, because a lot of people work with, oh, where, where did it go? This one. Um, they work with reflection maps which is this guy right here. Um, so reflection maps are technically, and again, I learned this from Cinecat Bro. Man, this, this tutorial is all about him. But I, I, I asked him a whole bunch of questions on Twitter, and I learned that reflection is not actually physically accurate. That a material can't have reflection, like it's a physical fakery, basically. Um, so most materials in the real world, I think they have only like one to 4% of reflection outside of the Fresnel. The rest of it is all controlled by the roughness. So a lot of the time we think that it is controlled by the reflectivity value. It's actually the roughness going up or down. Um, so little thing there for you. But again, artists do want that control. So that is why I'm adding it in here. And I want it there to be a separate map for it. So I'm going to take that output there, put that into the bottom input. Uh, make sure that for your, your shader, sorry, the, your mix RGB node here, this factor is set to one and it is set to screen, not add. If you set it to add, it can be brighter than physically possible, which is not what you want. So set it to one, put that in there like it should. All right, good. Okay, so now this value here controls the reflectivity. So if I set that all the way to black, it's like it should be before, like it's not contributing anything to it at all. And then the more I set it to, the more it's contributing. So. I can now add in my final map, which is going to be the reflectivity no re reflectivity map. <clears throat> Let me get another drink here. Now, if I take that and put that into the input there, now it is contributing to the reflectivity value like that. But again, I want that less and more function, that little handy slider there. So I'm going to add that in right now. Oop just by doing, duplicating that less more node. I'm gonna put that into, my goodness, that goes in there. This goes in here. And then the amount, ooh, we want that special slider. 
so I should have should have done that for this one. But anyway, put that in there. There we go. And I can delete it. Put that there. And now finally, oh, rename this. Less more. Reflection map. And there we go. So I hope that this is making some sort of sense here. So the difference between roughness and reflection is that roughness is just making the reflection softer. Uh, so like smoother looking reflection as opposed to a sharper reflection. Reflectivity is defining which parts of it are dif the diffuse shader and which parts of it are the gloss shader. So if I set this all the way to zero and delete everything else. Um, mm, oh, that's right. Because I didn't set this to the proper value. This should be set to minus one. Default value zero. Now I set that all the way to zero. Now we're looking at just 100% Diffused, 100% red color. There's nothing else going on here at all. Then, uh, and then I can control the roughness of that. So you can see I've still got the basic controls that we had at the start there, but we've now got the functionality of adding in maps if we want them. So now I can make it um, more and more use of reflection in relation to the map there. If I didn't have a map, this would just work as a standard sort of uh, slider. So put that back in there. Put this one back in here to control the roughness. And then I'll put this one to control the normal. And then this one to control the color value. Turn that back. Okay, so the reflectivity, I usually just leave it all the way down to a very low value, like 0.9, if that. So it's slightly using some of this map, but not really. Just a tiny bit. Just giving a little hint of reflection right in the center there. And then the rest of it is really controlled by this roughness value which I usually leave, I just sort of amp it up just slightly. Um, this is These sliders here, by the way, a lot of people like to use color ramps instead. You can still do that. Like if you wanna have a really contrasted thing, you can go crazy with that. Um, it's just that this, this uh, idea that I've uh, got here, it just gives you a slider, um, just one slider right here, which just makes it easy to see, you know, exactly what's going on. Um, without getting too characters. So that's just sort of exaggerated that effect right there. So you're welcome to use all of your separate little color ramp nodes and everything, but this little setup here will just make it a lot easier. All right. Um, and just because I know it can be really confusing whilst you're looking at a tutorial, I'm just gonna make this full screen right now so that you can get a, oh my goodness, stop moving around. Come on, there we go so that you can get a screen grab of exactly what is in the uh, the layout right here. The, I'm gonna look at the less is more node. Okay, so that's the setup that we've got right here. I'm not gonna explain the math again because I always, I don't understand it myself really, but it is what it is and it works. Uh, and then we've got the Fresnel node, which is fairly basic, which looks like that. Roughness going into there, bump, yeah, etc. I'm trying to pretend like I know what's going on. And there we go. Haha, <laughs> so now you have finally, you've got this one node which can be used to make any material you want within reason. Um, so going back to the uh, presentation here, let me go to the last slide of the thing. Um, and that is to mention, come on, this one. Dielectrics and metals. So what we have just made is called a dielectric material, which is the most common material probably in the known world. Um, and that fits just most things like a fabric shirt, a coffee cup, plastic, car paint. It's all a dielectric. A metal is slightly different. And that is what we're gonna be covering in part two. So this shader um, that we've just created, I'm gonna call PBR uh, Dielectric. I think that's probably Dial, uh, 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 Dielectric, good. <laughs> so I mentioned at the start that I would show you how to uh, make it so you have this automatically loaded whenever you um, do anything. So let's just call this PBR tutorial. So you save your .blend file. Uh, so now, oh, come on. Open up a new scene in Blender. 
Uh, I'll just add a new material just so that we've got something there. And then let's go and append in the new material that we just created. So you click the name of the dot blend there, go node tree, and then select PBR dielectric, the one that we've just created and click append from library. Nothing will have happened except that if you go to group, you can see that you've got the, PB, the PBR dielectric as well as these other ones which are inside it, which you can now add into it. So that is how you just append in a node tree. Um, but to make sure that it is applied no matter what, um, yeah, no matter what is going on in your scene, I'm just making it apply to this material and I'm gonna hit the F button and then click, uh, I'll just call this actually PBR, hmm, probably dielectric. Electric. Oh, I spelled it wrong again. You get the point. Um, and now, now that I've got this done, I can go and hit save startup file done. So now when I add, when I create a new startup file, I've got this. So now as I'm working in Blender and I'm doing about adding a new material or whatever, I can, you know, very quickly, if I just added a new material, I can then go and click PBR dielectric and hey, bada boom, bada, bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> ah, I'm lame. Um, oh, I forgot to make that one a black value there. But anyways, other than that, it is spot on. And there you go. So that is how you do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you can make some cool looking shaders. Um, now that you've done that, don't have to worry about it again. Um, it now functions in much the same way that Marmoset does, straight out of the gate. Um, so you don't have to do any of this stuff in other software or some other software. But now we've done it for cycles once, we just have to add that in now whenever we want and we've already got the nice looking shaders. So that was part one, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you would like to watch part two, go ahead and click on the link in front of you right now and that'll take you through to the video so you can check it out and where we'll be doing metallics, um, the other part of, uh, of PBR materials. Thank you for watching. If you like it, give me a like and hit subscribe if you want to see more tutorials like this one. Thanks for watching. Bye.